Hi, I'm Jonathan Edwards, and I want to welcome you to the Jed Breaks Bread podcast. My goal in this podcast is to teach the truth of the Word of God and apply it to our lives that our orthopraxy might be as good as our orthodoxy. May you be blessed. So last week after I posted part one of this series, The Doctrine of Money, I came home and my wife said to me, I saw your new podcast uploaded. And I said, yeah. And she said, the doctrine of money, that's rather interesting. And I said, well, uh, Stephen and I had talked about doing a you know, small three or four part series on financial management, money management. I said, I thought the doctrine of money sounded like a good title. And she said, well, what does it mean? I said, well, that's, that's a good question. Maybe I ought to explain that. And so when I thought about that title, the doctrine of money, from a theological perspective or a scholarly perspective, rather, anytime you trace a theme or a truth throughout the Bible, and then you summarize or collate and put together all of those verses and ideas, and you try to make statements about that, we call it a doctrine. Systematic theologies are the books where these doctrines are coalesced, they are published, they are debated, um, many sides of the same issue are examined because it seems like, well, this verse says this, but this other verse kind of says that, and so they go back and forth over these same things. In all my time of uh, studying and going through school, I never found a really a category for the doctrine of money in a systematic theology. But when you look at the idea or the concept of money and what it is and how it's used and how it can either honor God or be a distraction from one's walk with God, I think it's very apparent that money is a theme that runs throughout the scriptures and that God has a doctrine of money that he wants us to understand. A doctrine about money. What should we think about it? And then how should we live it out? In other words, here's what God says about money, and here's what to do with that particular knowledge. I don't know that Christians think about money in these terms very often. I know that Christians think about money a lot, though. In fact, everybody thinks about money a lot. Why? Why do we know that to be true? Well, I'm sure that everyone listening sits down once a month to pay all their bills. Water bill, electric bill, heat bill, mortgage, rent, uh, phone bill, all kinds of bills. So you're thinking about money as you're paying those bills. You're thinking about money when you go to the grocery store or you want to go out to eat. You think about money when you drag yourself out of bed in the morning and say, ah, I got to go to work today. I don't really want to go to work today, but I have to go to work today. So whether we consciously think about it or not, we are all thinking and doing something that relates to acquiring money or spending money. And God knew this would be the case. God understood that money was an essential part of living. And so I think that's why in calling this the doctrine of money, one thing I'm hoping to do is just point out some broad patterns or some broad principles that God has established in the scriptures that ought to help Christians think about and spend their money. So let's get started. First of all, defining money or possessions. When I think about this, I think in terms of currency. Now, a currency is really anything that has value, that can be traded for something else. In our culture, we tend to think of currency as like paper or coin, or we've even been conditioned to think of like digital currency, like electronic funds transfers. Um, I can pay you some money for a service and never actually exchange coins or paper if I 
PayPal you, for example, or if I use Apple Pay, I'm just making a deposit or a transfer rather from my account to your account and it shows up in dollar bills, but no actual currency changes hands. Like no paper, no product changes hands like paper or coins. So a currency is anything that has value. In other cultures, currency could be flocks, chickens, goats, land, servants, uh, in our culture, you can trade uh, goods uh, for one to another, although that's very that's limited. That's not as as common as using coins or paper or a digital transaction. There are types of currency that are really new and revolutionary, such as Bitcoin. These are all different ways that people have created or invented in order to say that one person who has this object can get or buy or purchase the other object that another person has that creates a, an even market, an even exchange. And I haven't tried to be exhausted in all the currencies or trades or services that could be listed, but you get the idea, right? A currency is anything that can be traded for something else. Now, currencies in and of themselves are morally neutral. Okay, so gold, silver, paper, electronic funds, bitcoins, uh, even goats or chickens or anything, they're all morally neutral. And the only reason that a currency is accepted or denied has to do with what is generally deemed appropriate for that particular culture. So if I were to go to Africa and down to the equator and visit the pygmies, and I wanted to buy a product that the pygmies were selling, let's say that they had some kind of uh, rare oil that I wanted for medicinal purposes, and I went down to the pygmies and showed them, you know, $500 bills, like five $100 bills. And I said, I want a little vial of this oil for five $100 bills. If those pygmies didn't know that $100 bills were very valuable, they wouldn't trade me the oil for the $100 bills. They wouldn't. Now, maybe they do know. I don't know. You know, I'm not familiar with what the pygmies understand or don't understand about currency and world markets, but I do know this. If they don't think something's valuable to them, they're not going to give you what you want. And it's that same way with anybody. Somebody could come to America and offer me, you know, a million yen for my car. If I don't know what the value of a yen is, if that doesn't mean anything to me, why would I give up my car for a million yen? Yes, a million sounds like a great number, but how do I even know that as a good deal? Do how many yen does it take to make a dollar? I don't know, you know. So currencies are established by the culture that somebody lives in and by the fair market that celebrates the exchange of either labor or products for some currency that is deemed appropriate. Okay, that again, that could be paper, money, it could be animals. It could be services, whatever. So this currency, as we've established, is morally neutral. So what principle rules over the currency? What principle from God's word ought to rule over how we think about money, currency, what we value in our society? You know, there is one overarching principle. We began talking about it last week that really impacts how Christians ought to think about what is valuable in their society, what passes for currency, and then what to do with that currency. And it is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God says, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle. And here's the key uh, phrase, over all the earth. 
So not just over all the land or land animals and ocean animals and the animals in the sky, but over all the earth, that includes all the metals that are found in the earth. That would include any of the oils or other resources that are found in the earth. That includes everything on the earth or inside the earth. God has given mankind dominion to rule over all of it. But there is a responsibility that goes along with the command to rule, and that is the responsibility of stewardship. And so we are to exercise dominion, exercise rule, but in what way and to what end? You see, Adam was to be a steward and a caretaker of the creation. He was to do what was best for the creation in terms of how it brought glory to God and how it could be used for man's benefit. Let's say that again. He was to be a steward over all the earth to make decisions according to what would best bring glory to God and what would be best for the benefit of mankind. And that was his original intent and purpose. That was, I'm sorry, that was God's original intent and purpose for Adam And I believe Adam was faithful in trying to carry that out. But in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam sinned by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the curse of sin came upon Adam, and men fell underneath the curse of sin. And what did the curse of sin do? The curse of sin said, you now, man, have to work hard to get what you want. You can't just have it anymore. It won't be easy for you. Now, there was some work involved for Adam, but it was not laborious toil like Genesis 3 makes clear. Men had to all of a sudden do a great labor to get what they wanted from the earth and to subdue it and to exercise this dominion. And Another result of the curse of sin is that man's internal and intrinsic nature was changed and transformed. Man was no longer seeking to do what glorified God the most. Man was seeking to do what benefited him the most. You understand that? Man was seeking to do what benefited him the most. And it did not take more than one generation for covetousness and greed to enter into the realm of mankind and to result in the murder of one man to another. You see, Cain coveted the fact that Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God and his was not. Ultimately, the author of Hebrews says that was because Abel was a man of faith and Cain was a man who was not of faith. That's why his sacrifice was rejected. But he coveted what he didn't have. He wanted that recognition, that prestige, and he became angry. And God said to him, you know what, Cain? Sin is crouching at your door. If you don't master it, it will rule over you. And Cain was not able to master the sin, and it ruled over him to the degree that he decided to murder his brother because he coveted that which his brother had, which was God's favor. This plays out not just in terms of wanting or receiving the favor of God, but this plays out in everyone's everyday interactions with money. Men covet what they don't have. Men are greedy, and they love money, and they love possessions, and they believe mistakenly that the acquiring of money or possessions will provide peace, happiness, comfort, security, all types of things. And that's not true. And we know objectively that that's not true, but, but it's very difficult in practice to not do that. 
it's difficult in practice to basically swim against the tide of the satanic world system that says, yes, you have to have these things. You have to acquire certain possessions. You have to have a certain amount of money. You have to be able to afford all of these flashy things in order to have a peaceful, prosperous, successful, and comforting life. The covetousness that is promoted by the satanic world system and the love of money contribute to men now making decisions from a self-centered and self-serving perspective rather than a perspective of stewardship. You see, and th- this is really one of the issues that I think ought to, it ought to enter into our political discourse, but it won't because it's a biblically based issue. So nobody wants to bring the Bible into political discourse. But the reality is those who say we ought to care for the environment have a great point. God says we are to rule over the environment but to rule with a godly stewardship, with an eye to bringing glory to God and benefit to mankind. All of us. All together. That's a good point. But then others say, no, no, no. We, we need to do whatever we want to do. We need to utilize the resources to make as much money as possible for our own benefit. Because, hey, you know, it's too bad that they didn't invent it. Too bad that they didn't think about that. They should have. They should have been smarter. Should have been better. They weren't. And then people say things like, well, why should I be responsible for their lack of industry? Why should I care about them? I'm out to get mine. You see, that's the ultimate expression of the sinful heart. I'm out to get mine. And whatever happens to anybody else doesn't matter as much as what happens to me. But for the believer, you know, I can wholeheartedly agree with the Apostle James when he says, Beloved, brethren, these things must not be amongst you. This is not how Christians are to act or to think about money. On one hand, wanting to get everything for yourself, and care only about your own interests and your own desires and your own glory. And on the other hand, saying, well, well, we can't do anything for ourselves because we'll screw it up for somebody else. You know, we have to think about the poor uh, person who's way over there. And um, no, no, we have to have a balanced perspective on currency and the use of money. Like so many other good gifts that God has given, men's attitude towards money and his purpose for using currency has been corrupted by sin. And it is for that reason that we have to look at the doctrine of money. What does God say about money throughout the scriptures that should inform our thought processes and our decision making as believers? Well, I think that God points out first in his word that men are not to be lovers of money. We can talk about this in a lot of ways, right? Men are not to be lovers of money. We can talk about it as a violation of the 10th word given to the nation of Israel, the 10th commandment, do not covet, all right? We can talk about it in those contexts. If you're a lover of money, you are naturally coveting what is not yours because you want to acquire something that God has not given you. You're working hard to get it and God has not bestowed it upon you. And the implication is not that you're working hard in an honest way, but that you're working hard in a dishonest way. So you're not just violating let's say, the 10th commandment, but you're violating other commandments in God's word to get this money. This is a warning to the church in general from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Notice it says the love of money, not money itself. Some Christians, 
Some so-called Christian groups have really gone wrong on this by saying, yes, it's money in and of itself that makes you wicked in God's eyes. No, that's not the case at all. It's the love of money. What does that mean, the love of? It means to desire something, to want to get it because you have your heart set upon that currency, because you have your heart set upon that money, you will perform all sorts of evil in order to get that which your heart is set upon. You may say, well, I'm so offended by that. I'm not performing evil. I'm, I'm going to work every day. I'm, I'm doing an honest job. You know, I'm working like 10 to 12 hours a day to provide for my family. I'm making sure that You know, I pay all the bills and I get my kids everything they want and I get my wife everything she wants. And, you know, I'm really, really working hard. Okay, that may be true. Let's think about this. Is your love of money and your desire to acquire it putting at jeopardy your fulfilling of God's other obligations to you as a husband and leader in your home? Yeah. You know, if it is, then the love of money has been a root for all sorts of evil to you. Yeah, maybe you're not stealing the money. Maybe you're not murdering to get the money. Maybe you're not dishonestly getting the money. But maybe, maybe the evil that you're performing is to place the priority of gaining money ahead of the priority of worshiping God and caring for your family. That's why this is a warning to the church in general Love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, Solomon begins writing to his son, and he is encouraging his son to practice the truth that Solomon taught him. And he says, here's why you have to practice the truth. Here's why you have to obey the teachings that I lay before you. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even whole as those who go down to the pit. Son, don't go with these people. Why? What is the enticement that they're using to commit murder and ambush and theft? We will find all kinds of precious wealth, verse 13. We will fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us. We shall all have one purse. My son, the love of money will cause you to do things that are wicked, things that you didn't imagine you could possibly do. But if you love money, you could find yourself doing those wicked things. Solomon says, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path. And so here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, we have a warning to the church, to believers in general. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Then in the Old Testament, we have the same concept repeated. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent, because what they're going to say is, let's set our heart on riches, and in order to get the riches, here's what we're going to do. We're going to murder. We're going to rob other people. We're going to take advantage of people. We're going to run to evil, and we're going to be quick to shed blood. Yeah, that's what the love of money will cause somebody to do. You know, God expects those who know him and those who serve him to not have a heart set on money. Now, that's just for the average believer. That's just for the everyday Christian who sits in the pews. Think about the impact of having a pastor or a deacon who loves money and what they might do in order to procure it. That's why earlier in Paul's letter, part of the qualifications for being an elder, part of the qualifications for being a deacon, forbids that individual from being somebody who is a lover of money somebody who is not fond of sordid gain. Why? Why, Paul? Because elders and deacons are oftentimes making financial decisions for the church. They can't be lovers of money or fond of sordid gain because it would compromise their integrity. It would compromise the word of God. It would compromise the local church. It could lead to disastrous results. 
not just in the lives of the pastor or the deacon, but in the lives of the flock whom they are commanded to guard. Shepherds are commanded to look over the flocks, and deacons are shepherd are commanded to care for the flocks in a servant-based ministry. So it is not money that is the problem. It is how you view money, how you think about money. It is the doctrine of money that you have established in your own heart. We all have doctrines that we establish based upon our reading of the Word of God. We're constantly refining our doctrines, and many times we're refining our doctrines based on external circumstances, not based on continued and further study of the Word of God. Jesus had something very serious to say about the believer's relationship to money. Jesus understood that man in his fallen nature was prone to look at money or currency as the solution to all problems. And so what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. And here's the key. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, if you love money, your heart is going to want to pursue money. Your heart is going to be chasing after money. Your heart is going to want to do those things that would result in you acquiring more money or possessions. But if your treasure is in heaven, your heart is going to want to do those things that would honor God, that would glorify Jesus, that would result in his praise and the advancement of his kingdom. And you will be working for God's glory and benefit, not your own. You know, Jesus sums it up very quickly very succinctly, no one, this is Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. That doesn't mean, okay, believer, that doesn't mean that you can't have a job, that you can be a couch potato and all of a sudden God will just provide for you. What it means is you cannot serve What is your master or who is your master? Is money your master or is Jesus your master? If you are the servant of another, if you are the servant of another, you do that which your master requires. And so if you're a servant of God, you're going to do the things that God requires. But if you're a servant of wealth, you're going to do the things that wealth requires. And doing what wealth requires is incompatible with serving God. Now, let me answer a big question. Does this mean it's wrong for Christians to be wealthy? Does it mean it's wrong for Christians to work? Absolutely not. In fact, the Bible says that one of a husband's and a father's chief responsibilities is to be the provider for his household. He is to go and labor diligently so that he can care for his wife and his children. That is a great responsibility that God has given. Where Christians get messed up is that they think that greater wealth will lead to greater service to God, and that is not always a one-to-one correlation. You see, we justify getting more money or earning more money by saying, well, I'll be able to help the church more. I'll be able to do this, or I'll be able to give to that mission organization. And we deceive ourselves into thinking that because we have a larger bank account and we're able to give more money, that we're being pleasing to God. But as I previously mentioned, if you are violating one of God's other principles, one of God's other standards for righteousness. Not not a righteousness that leads to salvation, but the righteousness that demonstrates a person is truly saved. 
right? The type of righteousness that demonstrates that you want to be holy like God is holy. All right, we're talking about righteous living. This is orthopraxy, taking your doctrine and putting it into practice. If you are compromising other areas of truth in order to acquire wealth, then your heart and your master is truly wealth, not God. So many Christians are entrapped by the thinking that if I have more money, I'll be more effective for God's kingdom. You know what Jesus said to just about every single person who came up to him and said, well, you know, I have this money that I have to do something with, and I want to serve you, Lord, but I have this money, or I have this physical responsibility. Jesus said, hey, let the physical responsibilities go. Somebody will take care of those things. You follow me. You follow me. And let God provide for all of your needs. Jesus doesn't want your money as much as he wants your devotion to truth, to right living, to serving in his kingdom. Jesus wants your devotion. He wants your time. He wants to be the center of your decision-making process. And if Jesus is not the center priority in your decision-making process, then you probably have to ask yourself real hard, do I love money? Do I serve money or serve Jesus? That's, that's the real bottom line when you get down to looking at the doctrine of money. That's the foundational principle. That's where you start with before you even think about investing or debt or how to use money. You start by answering that basic question, do I serve God or do I serve wealth and how you spend your time will tell a great deal about whether you serve God or whether you serve wealth. I hope you really take some time to meditate on that. Pray, ask God to give you wisdom to do a proper and true evaluation and ask God to give you the faith necessary to say no to work and yes to serving God if you find yourself in that particular situation. I want to thank you for listening today. You can send comments to gracebrethrenchapel at gmail.com. If you want to check out some more of our teaching or our instruction, you can visit us on a Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. We're on the corner of State Route 590 and Route 20 near Fremont, Ohio. And you can check us out on the web at www.gbchapel.com. Once again, thank you to S. Lore Music Group for their behind-the-scenes production work on this podcast.